Welcome to chapel at the Institute of Lutheran Theology. The Reverend Timothy J. Swenson here, and it is a delight to welcome you to this service done in anticipation of the fourth Sunday of Advent, Series B. If you have the order of service in front of you, then let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our litany is, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. And so we join in prayer. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Take away the hindrance of our sins and prepare us for the celebration of your birth that we may receive you in joy and serve you always. For you live and reign with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today is received from the first chapter of St. Luke, uh, beginning in the 26th verse. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent forth from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The Gospel of our Lord. Greetings to you. Greetings to you on this day that the Lord has made a day for us to rejoice and be glad. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Mary declares, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. As much as Mary is held up as a model of faith and acceptance of the Lord's work in her life, we must also hold up another biblical example who accepts God's work in his life, Eli, the judge of Israel who mentored Samuel. God provides Eli with a word of judgment. His sons have been wicked, despising their offerings to the Lord. 
the Lord also judges Eli because he failed to discipline his sons. Samuel delivers this message of judgment from the Lord. Eli's response to hearing this message is to say, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. 1 Samuel 3, 18. The sons of Eli die in battle with the Philistines who rout the Israelite army and capture the Ark of the Covenant. Upon hearing this news, Eli falls over backwards from his chair and dies. Yet, yet we heard Eli respond to Samuel's announcement with a most succinct definition of the passion of the Christian life. Mary, too, responds to the angel Gabriel's announcement with a most succinct definition of the passion of the Christian life. Serving God is pure passivity. This humble passivity is the passion of faith. Mary declares that God's word works on her, rules her, and defines her very existence. For Mary, to have a passionate life means that God is having his way with her. She doesn't choose from among various options. She doesn't decide to have faith. God's word has been spoken, and that is sufficient for her. It is the bread she lives by. We can compare Matthew 4.4. 4. The word of the Lord has been spoken. It will come about as he has said. There is no more to be decided. There is still another who teaches us the passionate Christian life. That is the passive reception of God's work upon us. This is the Apostle Paul. We receive from him, through his letter to the Christians in Rome of nearly 2,000 years ago, we receive this mysterious and cryptic declaration, the obedience of faith. It is mysterious because of its union with our baptism into Christ. It is cryptic because it may be set within the context of obedience to the law, but it has nothing to do with the law. Instead, it is completely dependent upon Jesus Christ, who is the end of the law for all to believe. To get, get at the complexity of Paul's mysterious and cryptic declaration, the obedience of faith, let us consider the teaching of the German theologian and pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was imprisoned and hanged at age 39 by the Third Reich shortly before its surrender to the Allied forces in World War II. In his book, Discipleship, Bonhoeffer sets forth a paradox. Only the obedient belief only the believing obey. Only the obedient believe. Only the believing obey. His paradox represents the complexities of the Apostle Paul's declaration, the obedience of faith. Paul has heard the preaching of Jesus' command, repent, believe the good news, Faith is commanded, and faith does as it is commanded, so that we may accomplish this paradox, and so that God will be glorified through it. Paul names God as the one who strengthens us, the one who establishes us for this bringing about the obedience of faith. God establishes in the, us in this faith in three ways. First, according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Secondly, 
according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages. And thirdly, according to the command of the eternal God. Simply put, God commands both preaching and the content of that preaching. Preachers hand over Jesus Christ, him crucified, and him alone. This is the gospel, the good news. This good news reveals the mystery kept secret from the foundation of the earth. God has chosen you. Ephesians 1, four, verse 4. God elected you in Christ long ages ago. As your preacher delivers Jesus Christ to you, that election in Christ is delivered to you. The preaching of Jesus Christ applies your election to you. It is delivered as for you. In this way, God gets all the glory, and the prophecy of Revelation 7.10 is fulfilled. Salvation belongs to our God. Eli Mary, Paul, and there is still more, more who teach us on the passion of the Christian life. Yes, we have come to you, the ones to whom the flesh still adheres, you who still live under the first half of Bonhoeffer's paradox, only the obedient believe. You must obey Christ's command, follow me, which simply means that you are found in the church, the body of Christ established by the preaching of Christ, like those first disciples who heard Jesus' concrete command, follow me. You too must get up. You must be obedient to that command to get yourself to the place where Jesus can be had, where Jesus is present unambiguously. But there, there coming under the word of God, there, there faith comes to you, is established in you, transfers you from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And when such faith comes, when faith comes, it exposes all that prior obedience, all that getting up and following, all that hearing of the command as dead works. They belong to this old and passing away creation. They belong to the old you, the old Adam or the old Eve. Those works and that obedience do not belong to the new creature of faith, a new creature who does not achieve life through obedience and works, but rather receives life through the preaching of Jesus Christ, him crucified and him alone. Only the obedient who get themselves to a preacher of Christ come to believe. Such preaching establishes you in the faith of Christ. So that you might have such faith, God has established the office of preaching. God has willed that you do not come to faith on your own. He has provided you with a preacher in whose preaching the Holy Spirit works not through your own understanding or effort, but through the call of the gospel and its promises delivered from human lips and driven into your ears by the Holy Spirit. This God, having his way with you, receiving his work, is the passion of your Christian life. Out of that faith, out of that passionate reception of God's work upon you, you now spontaneously obey, not because it's commanded of you, but because of who you are. A mortal creature whose life is Christ. Compare Galatians 2, verse 20. There is no thought of compulsion or reward, 
but only the spontaneous life of the one who confesses, Let it be with me as the Lord has said. Living out of that confession, you now fulfill the second half of Bonhoeffer's paradox, only the believing obey. Your passionate Christian life does not consist of the religious fervor which you may or may not demonstrate. It does not consist, your passionate Christian life does not depend upon the zealousness of your discipleship. Your passionate Christian life does not depend upon the quanti quantity or quality of good works which you display. No, it is not so. Your passionate Christian life arises solely because you have the Spirit-filled Word of God delivered to your ears by your preacher. Hear now your passion. I am the Lord your God, Exodus 5.20. I have formed your inmost parts, knit you together in your mother's womb, and made you in wonder and fear for praise. Psalm 139. Before the foundations of the earth, I have chosen you in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.4. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28. Child of God, you have been marked by the cross of Christ and sealed by the Holy Spirit forever. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. By the authority of Jesus Christ and in his stead, I forgive you all your sins. These words are God's work upon you, words announcing His work, not your work. You only receive them. They are the passion of your Christian life. Out of them you respond with the obedience of faith. Let it be to me as the Lord has said. Thanks be to God. Amen. So we continue with our prayers as, uh, as you are invited to respond with Lord in your mercy. Uh, your response will be, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, open my ears to hear your word delivered by my preacher, as law and gospel, death-dealing, yet life-giving. Use your Holy Spirit to give me the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that I would have faith only in him. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Father in heaven, open my ears that your Holy Spirit would pour the life of Jesus Christ into me, Deliver me into his kingdom, where I will live in innocence, righteousness, and blessedness. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Father in heaven, open my ears, that I would live by every word that comes from your mouth, as your word is spoken to me by my preacher. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Father in heaven, Open my ears that I would hear your word and have, your ne have my neighbor's needs revealed to me, and then be encouraged to be useful to them in satisfying those needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Father in heaven, open my ears that I would hear your word and not grow weary in my usefulness to those neighbors near and far who surround me. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Father in heaven, open my ears that I would know of the Institute of Lutheran Theology and its mission. 
ILT shall preserve, promote, and propagate the classical Christian tradition from a Lutheran perspective, in order that I may direct both students and supporters to it. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Father in heaven, open my ears that I might rest in you while being useful to my neighbors during this time of waiting for the day of the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Grant us these things, Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art, who art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.